Good morning again. It's really nice here to have us here this week. And I'm really looking forward to getting to know you all and, you know, learning from you as much as we can hopefully teach you as well. Uh, I'm going to pray before we open God's word together and uh, so we can hear and understand him more clearly. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that your word does speak to us. As we sit here this morning with so many things confusing and complicating our minds and drawing our attention away, we do pray that you help us focus on what you have to say to us. Give us hearts that are ready to hear your word and ears that are eager to listen. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. You know what a really tough situation is? You know, a really tough place where no matter what you do, no matter what choice you make, you know it is not going to be the right one. It's like one of those situations where you're really stuck between a rock and a hard place. The situation that I'm thinking of is when somebody asks you to do something and you know that you either can't do it or you won't do it. And you're stuck between these two incredibly undesirable choices. It's a real dilemma, isn't it? I mean, have you ever been in a situation like this before? A situation where, you know, a friend or a family member or someone that you've worked for has asked you to do something and you know that you either have to say no or say yes, knowing there is no way you were going to do it. And I think the reason why these sorts of situations sort of get our anxiety going is because they often result in conflict. And the reason why they result in conflict for us and why we find it so hard is because we're just standing in front of someone that we know and care about, our friend, family member, or perhaps somebody that we work for is actually responsible for signing your cheque at the end of the week, and you just don't want to upset them. So you say yes, just to save face, but you know that you were only delaying the inevitable. You were just delaying the inevitable disappointment when, down the road, you do not do what you've been asked to do. I think the reason why it's so hard, it's fair to say, is because what we do and say matters, because integrity matters. And the relationship between what we do and what we say really says a lot about our hearts. True integrity is when, these, when your words and actions link up together. See, the relationship between them is just like a window into who a person really is. And if they do not relate well to each other, it's a real indication of the person that they really are. See, as a church this morning and next Sunday, we're going to be taking a look at one of Jesus' parables that he told. And we're going to be doing this with the hope of seeing him more clearly. Which is quite an interesting thing, really, when you think about it, because actually most of the time Jesus told parables to actually confuse the people he was telling people about. But every so often there was a person who, when they heard the parable, truly understood. And my prayer was just like those people this morning, that it will be like fog being brought away, like a, a curtain being opened to us, and we will see and understand Jesus more clearly. But the reason why Jesus' parables had this confusing and clearing sort of effect on people is because they were just simple little stories with a very, that had a lot of meaning behind them. They were light-hearted little tales that packed a huge punch. See, this morning we're looking at the Jesus parable of the two sons in Matthew's Gospel. Uh, Jesus was telling this particular parable to the religious leaders of his day and this simple little story that Jesus tells them has a lot of meaning for them and for us. This light-hearted little tale has a real punch waiting for them and for us. This is because Jesus is saying through this parable that integrity is so important and how your words and your actions actually line up together, they are a true indication of where your heart is. If your heart is not right, then your deeds and words are actually empty. And this morning we're going to be looking at the three things, three parts that come out of this parable. First we'll look at the question that Jesus presents, then the answer, and then the reality. So let's open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 21, and we're going to be starting at verse 28. So 
before we look at the question, how about we look at who the question is actually aimed at? Before this parable, Jesus has been making his way through Jerusalem and the starting of chapter 21 describes his arrival into the holy city. This amazing celebration of the people of Jerusalem welcoming him, cheering, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest of heaven. The picture that the start of the chapter 21 is painting for us is a picture of a celebration of town welcoming a hero, or more accurately, welcoming a king, which is why this great celebration is actually hugely controversial. They were celebrating the arrival, the arrival of the promised Messiah, the one who was promised to come from the line of David, who had arrived, except... He was a nobody from a town of Galilee, and the fact that he had arrived, there was a huge challenge to the the leaders at the time. So, obviously, his presence has caused a bit of a stir, especially when he enters the temple. And he goes in there, the the temple being the actual, actual heart of Jerusalem, not just as the heart of the building in the city, but also the complete center for an Israelite's life. And he marches in there and he drives out all the people selling things in the market. And he makes this huge statement in chapter 21, verse 13. My house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it into a den of robbers. (laughs) Talk about causing a stir. Jesus has just marched into the heart of the city, the temple of Jerusalem, and just said it is actually his house. You know, the building where God lives. So Jesus then continues to heal the blind and the lame around him, and the stir grows and it grows, and it catches the attention of the high priests and elders of the temple. So they approach him and ask a very obvious question that anybody would ask of some upstart from a country town who's waltzed into the place that you have been put in charge of and starts claiming that this place, well, it's actually my house. They ask him in verse 23, by what authority are you doing these things and who gave you this authority? And then Jesus does what he often does. He takes their questions and turns it back on them and they have no answer for him. Jesus then refuses to answer their original question, but instead asks them to consider the parable that we're looking at this morning. From verse 28, what do you think? There is a man who had two sons. He went to the first son and said, son, go and work today in the vineyard. I will not, he answered, but later changed his mind and went. Then the father went to the other son and said the same thing. He answered, I will, sir, but he did not go. Which of the two sons did what the father wanted? So, what does this little tale about a man with two sons have to actually to do with anything? Well, that's a good question. The parable is designed to present the religious leaders with this awful, that awful dilemma. To say no and upset the other person, or say yes, knowing that you were not going to do something and suffer the consequences down the track. Jesus does this by using the parable by separating these two parts of the dilemma and putting them in and representing them into the characters of the two sons. So the father asks the first son to work in the vineyard. He says he will not. He does not desire to do what the father has asked him. Now, depending on what culture, your family dynamic, or perhaps what generation belongs to, you could read this and go, good on him, well done. Or perhaps you could read this and think, what a terrible son. How could he do such a thing to his father? The second response is much closer to the response of the, of the culture of the time, because the first son, by saying no, that was hugely disrespectful to his father. The first son had chosen to say no and just deal with the immediate conflict. So the father then goes to the second son and says the same thing, and he says, I will, sir. Very respectful. But not just respectful, he's even showing that he actually desires to do what the father has asked him to do. So he's, but then he doesn't end up going 
and doing anything. He saved face in the first instance and now we can see that his words and his actions don't actually line up. That's a real indicator of his heart. And we have... I'm wondering, have you ever come across somebody like this before? You know, one of those really nice people who you come across and they're, they're really eager and want to please and so nice and caring and then you ask them to do something and on the day, where are they? The moment you actually need them, they are nowhere to be seen. I, um, I've known a few people like this. I used to work during my, what my family call my six year gap year after high school. I did a lot of hospitality jobs. There's one particular cafe that I was working in. One of the regular customers asked me to run the bar of their daughter's engagement party. There was going to be close to 200 people in this huge house. It was a really great opportunity and I knew I could not handle it by myself. So I asked one of my friends who I worked with, this young guy, and he was really keen. He was really, yes, I'm so, I will do that. I'll be there. It'll be so much fun. I'll be, it's going to be great. The day turned up, I got there, started setting up, and my friend never turned up. Never even heard from him. So obviously, I never trusted a word he said after that. After he left me to run a bar dispensing drinks to close to 200 people by myself, his words and his deeds became empty to me. And they didn't speak very well of his heart. So out of the two sons, which is better, Jesus asks. At this point, it seems much for muchness, doesn't it? Um, but the key to this parable is actually a part that I haven't mentioned yet. And it's really key to answering the question correctly. In verse 9, or verse 28 and 29, the... The son, after being asked to work at the vineyards, does actually end up changing his mind. He does go and help and work in the vineyard. But it's not a simple case of like, oh yeah, I guess I better do it. I suppose I'll do it. He has a complete change in heart. He recognises that he has spoken and acted out of turn with his father. But that was not the case for the second son. He just continued not to do the task what he'd been asked to do, which is worse by far, which leads us to the second point, the answer. Which of the two did what the father wanted? Is the question that still hangs in the air. Well, verse 21, uh, chapter 21, verse 31, they answered the first by the, the high priest and the elders, which is... You know, it makes sense. It's the conclusion that we've come to. The first son repented. So then why on earth does Jesus respond by continuing to say, truly I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. Didn't they get the question right? The first son was a good one. Uh, why does Jesus say something like, actually, the worst of society, the most unclean of society, those people will be in the kingdom of God ahead of you? Well, that's why this simple little story and this lighthearted tale is actually quite complex and packs a huge punch. The question we, sh we sh should be asking isn't actually which son got it right, although it's a really good question and very important. The question we should be asking is which of the two sons symbolises the high priests and elders? And I don't know if you've ever had that awful feeling when you know, you're sitting in a crowd and, or someone speaking describing the characteristics of certain personality types. Comedians do this all the time as part of their act. They'll try to make fun of people by saying that a certain type of person is like this and you'll be sitting in the crowd laughing with everyone. Oh, it's so true. It's so true. They're just like that. Then all of a sudden it drops and you realise that actually you are that personality type and you are the one who is looking foolish. But you were too proud to see it at first. See, that's what's happening here in our passage. The high priests and elders recognise that the first son was doing what the father's will and Jesus is telling the high priest, the elders, that they actually are symbolised by the second son. Ouch! 
So what is Jesus' point? What is he trying to tell them? Well, the high priests were given the responsibility of maintaining the purity laws of the Old Testament. They were supposed to keep Israel as a pure people under God, a marvel to the nations around them. The high priests and elders were supposed to practice the sacrificial system that God had given them. They were supposed to be the mediators between the Israelites and God. And they agreed to do so. They said, yes, I will, sir. But they weren't doing it. They allowed the temple to become a business market instead of a house of prayer. They were more concerned with their outward um, appearance and purity and power that more than the purity of the people that God had given them to look after. Their words didn't match up to their deeds. And it says a lot about their heart and the emptiness of their words and deeds. You see, the vineyard symbolizes Israel and the father of the two sons is God. And through this parable, Jesus is contrasting the two characters of the sons and showing symbolically the contrast between the high priest and the elders and the lowest and unclean of society. Why? Because the tax collectors and prostitutes repented. They were cleansed. And the religious leaders were too proud to notice that how filthy they were. What this parable shows symbolically is actually what is true in reality, which is my next point, the reality. After telling this parable and asking the high priest and the elders to identify the right son, the high priest and elders have identified themselves as the, second, as the wrong son. So what does this mean? And why? Well, Jesus gives the answer in verse 32. For John came to, to you to show you the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him, but the tax collectors and the prostitutes did even after you saw this, you did not repent and believe him. The John that Jesus is referring to is John the Baptist, and who in chapter 3 of Matthew's Gospel came out of the wilderness you know, calling out for people to repent and to be baptised and believe because the kingdom of God had come near and people had flocked to him, repenting their sin and being baptised. And and, but... In chapter 3, verse 7, when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to where he was baptizing, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance, and do not think that you can say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. The axe is already at the foot of the tree. And every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. So what Jesus is saying to the high priest is that you were warned by John. He warned you that you needed to repent. He told you that you needed to repent no matter what significant lineage that you might come from. Because unless you desire God's will, an axe will cut you down from your saving root. Because your words and actions are empty. You look the part inside, on the outside, but inside you are filthy. Even the tax collectors and prostitutes manage to believe, but you are too proud to see that you need to repent. You need to produce fruits. You need, you need, otherwise you will be cut down and thrown into the fire. That is the reality. But just like the high priests and elders needed a bit of help to see themselves in the second son, we too need a little help to see ourselves in the high priests and elders. Is it possible that our words and actions don't match up very well? Is it possible that if they don't, it's showing that perhaps there is an issue with our hearts? Are we too concerned with the way we look to other people, keeping up appearances, putting on a brave face that we haven't noticed that our hearts have gone filthy over time? Or perhaps they always were. And I know these are really personal questions and I know that I do not know you at all. But 
it would be very unloving of me not to ask the question that comes from this parable. Are you the second son? Am I the second son? And I have to ask this because John's warning also applies to you if you are. You too are under God's judgment. And, and the only way not to be is to repent and believe. Believe in the saving death, resurrection and ascension of Jesus Christ. Having faith only in his sacrifice that satisfies God's just justice. Be free from your sin and gain eternal life. See, what this part of Jesus, this parable shows to us more clearly to help understand who he is and what he has done, it shows to us his love for the lost, the downtrodden, the lowest of society, the filthy sinner who humbles themselves before God and turns, to the, turns their will not to be, I will, to the Father. The kingdom of God is open for those who humbly repent and believe but it is closed to the hypocrites who parade their righteousness around. And particularly those whose words and deeds have gone empty long ago. Because after all, didn't Jesus come to call the sinners, not the righteous? And this morning, I want to give you a chance to respond. I'm going to say two prayers, and the first prayer will be for those who feel like they have never repented and believed. Because this morning, this is your chance to do so. To repent and believe and trust and have your life transformed here, to be able to do the Father's will. And after that, I'll pray for the rest of us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, there have been many times that we've heard your call and your desire to do your will but we have turned against you Lord for the first time I want to pray that I will turn to you I repent my, may my heart be changed towards you may I desire to know you your love and your will for my life may you be the Lord of my life Amen and for the rest of us here Lord we do pray that if we have seen ourselves in the second sun, that we will not be too proud to see the darkness of our heart, that we too will repent of our sin as you encourage us to do and accept the, fa accept the fact and the amazing truth that there is no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. Help us to grow more and more into the likeness of your son and we, may we desire to do your will. We pray this in your son's name. Amen.